Welcome to Facility Files. I'm Elizabeth Ignatowitz. I'm Jeremy Haynes. A little introduction. I've been in facilities now for about 15 years and prior to that I have extensive background in electrical and generator stuff. I also did heating and air and plumbing as well. But most of all, my background is electrical. I brought you here today to talk about UPS and generators. You've kind of taught me a majority of what I know in facilities, but also UPS and generators. I know I've called you up many times saying, can you dumb this down for me? And you've done a great job. So I felt like you would be the one to talk about UPSs and generators. Let's just start with the basics. Like what is a UPS? A UPS is an uninterruptible power supply. Basically, if your facility loses power, it automatically transfers over to the UPS without losing power at all. So that's basically uninterruptible power supply. And that is backed up by batteries. The UPS itself, during a normal day-to-day, -day, it sits there and basically trickle charges the batteries. And then once power goes out, those batteries come online. Depending on how it's designed, depends on how much time you have on battery backup. Some instances where I have worked in the past, they wanted at least one hour backup. So their equipment doesn't go down because a lot of places that do have UPS systems, it's very system critical. And when they're down, they're losing, you know, upwards of millions of dollars a minute or an hour. So it's very vital for them to have a UPS type system. What is the difference between a UPS and a generator? For those of you that don't know, generators are, there's a lot of applications for generators. One thing I know in the past you used to see when diesel was a lot less expensive, you would see generators come on to do load shedding during peak demand. You also have generators per codes, electrical codes, you have to have a generator backup for emergency lighting. So that means if your store or your place of business loses power, you have to have a generator to come on and the emergency lights come on to give adequate enough lighting for your customers or your associates to exit the building. You can also have a generator where I've seen in the past where it actually covers the load of the entire building. Mm -hmm. um, so then if you have a UPS system, then basically that UPS system only covers that 10 or 15 seconds while the generator is coming up, getting set or ready to transfer to generator. Once it gets up to voltage, basically, then it transfers over to the generator until the power is restored back to the building. Now, a lot of times the transfer switches, ATS as they call them, automatic transfer switches, they're set up for multiple things let's just say power comes back out uh, comes back on and within a matter of seconds it goes back out so then that enters another time delay to where the generator will not transfer until power has been fully restored so I'm, as i mentioned uh, as far as generators for emergency lighting and i said it was code i do want to also state that you don't have to have an emergency generator for emergency lighting. You can also install battery backup emergency lighting uh, mm -hmm. to where you, you avoid the cost up front of installing the generator and the transfer switch and all of that. But you do have the added cost later on down the road of once all those lights, the batteries go bad, it's basically cheaper just to replace the f entire fixture. Yeah. But the main goal is, per a lot of code, electrical codes out there, is for generators or for backup lighting to provide adequate lighting to get outside the store and recently they've added a code to where they provide enough adequate lighting outside in the parking lot to get away from the building. Let's just say there's a fire and it's dark outside, the power is removed or power goes out to the building, whatever it is, and it's dark outside, you have to have backup lighting on the generator or battery backup ballast in those exterior lighting fixtures in order for associates or customers to get away from the building. Now, not necessarily your whole entire parking lot, but your wall packs on the wall at your emergency exits would need to be either on a backup generator or a battery ballasted fixture. And how often does that need to be tested? Well, from a business perspective or from the client's perspective, I should say, if you have a maintenance person on site, I would test the lighting once a month. If it's battery backup, you could go around and push the button on those, or you could kill the circuit or circuits, breakers they call it, uh, and see if all those lights come on. From a generator perspective, industry standard for a generator is to exercise once a week, if not every two weeks. I know there's a lot of discussions going on about 
transferring, when the generator exercises, does it transfer with load or without load? This is a big one. Um, I always like to convince my client to exercise with load. Basically what that means is when the generator exercises, it's going to transfer the load from the utility to the generator. And the reason being that is, is basically once a week, or ever how often they have it set up to test, you basically simulate a power outage. So if, you, if something is wrong, you're going to find it out on an exercise, not actually when the power's out. Yeah. There's a lot of reasons why folks do not, folks choose not to transfer with load. One meaning they have an open transition transfer switch, meaning it will only go to a generator when the power is lost. There's no transition with pairing up or paralleling with the utility to transfer the power over to the generator. So there will be a blink in power. If they have a closed transition transfer switch, then that transfer switch, when it signals the generator to come on for exercise times, the generator, it'll bring it up to speed. Once It'll parallel the voltage to, or sync the voltage with the utility. And within a matter of, we're talking milliseconds, that it will transition over to generator and the lights won't blink. So that's a lot, that's one of the reasons that a lot of clients, they don't want to interrupt their power yeah. during the day when folks are working at their computers and, and that sort of thing if they have open transition transfer switch. Now you have a question. If they had a UPS as well, would that prevent that interruption? Would the yes. UPS then cook on? Yes. Okay. It's beneficial for people that have critical things going on and you can't lose power to have a UPS and a generator, correct? Yes. There are a lot of instances though where on critical environments, their UPS is only back up their servers or their data, whatever they're sending out or receiving in from other sources. Their generator itself then only handles the emergency lighting and then obviously chillers or HVAC. Typically in a real critical environment like some of our cell phone service providers, they have what they call rectifiers and they have rooms just full of bat racks, rows of batteries, you know, floor to basically halfway to the ceiling. And those are called rectifiers that charge those batteries on a daily basis. And once power goes out, then those large bank of batteries normally handles your data type room situation. Uh, but your normal UP, smaller UPS systems is, you know, your data inside just your normal office building or for that matter, anything that's, I don't want to say life critical, but could potentially be life critical. Okay. As a facility manager, what are the basics that you would need to know about your UPS system if you were on site? What are some visual things that you need to know? Well, someone that's familiar with the equipment doesn't necessarily, like for instance, a maintenance technician, doesn't have to be very familiar in, in working on them, but just knowing the displays on them and then seeing if they're in an alarm, if they're in an alarm, knowing who to call if there is an issue. That's about the main thing that I would, you know, advise anyone in maintenance. Don't try and work on it. You're, if you're not qualified or you're not licensed to work on a UPS or generator, just know that the basics, if it is an alarm, you know, create a work order or call someone to tell them, hey, my, my UPS is down, it's showing a battery alarm, or hey, my generator's down, showing high coolant, low coolant, or over crank, or no fuel. Just make the, the normal day-to-day -day folks aware of what is normal and what is not normal. Now for UPS rooms, you need to keep it at a certain temperature. What temperature range should it be within? That varies. Normally, I would say anywhere from 68 to 72 degrees. You don't want it too low and you don't want it too high. Too high creates moisture, obviously more humidity in the air, potentially. So I would say anywhere from 68 to 72 degrees. Okay. Now, you and I got to go on a field trip the Saturday after Thanksgiving a couple years ago with our client. Can you explain what we did, why we were there? The utility company, they were replacing you said a transformer and we it, needed to lighten the load basically the the utility provider was upgrading some transformers upstream or downstream of ours and upstream of ours so the our client was going to lose power so you and i went in and i initiated a transfer from utility to the emergency generator so when that happens i just hit test run on the transfer switch and that, and that verbiage varies from transfer switch to transfer switch but basically we put the system in test where it brought the generator up it transferred to load and then 
you know, the power company could do whatever they wanted to do forever, how long they wanted to do it. And then once power was restored, our transfer switch sensed that and then obviously started the time delay process of transferring back to utility and then obviously cool down mode on the generator itself. So you know, there's a lot of different types, or there's not a lot of different types, but there's two most types, certain types of generators. One's diesel, one's natural gas. Those of you, I'm, I'm not trying to get into the specifics at all, but you know, normally on a diesel generator, when it's fully loaded, it creates a lot of heat. A turbo on it gets really hot, and a lot of times the instance of the cool down period is to allow that turbo to cool down to keep from seizing it up, because I've seen some where we've done, actually done load tests that they got so hot you could see through them. Wow. That's glowing hot and just letting it run for three to four minutes after you've removed load will not help it. It needs to actually run for 15 to 20 minutes at a, you know, at a, at a nice idle, which it'll, it'll automatically do that. I wouldn't suggest bypassing the cool down time unless you absolutely know what you're doing because if not, you could mess some things up. And then one thing I failed to mention uh, about testing with load or without load. So if you can, on a consistent basis, if you test a generator with no load, you are building carbon up in the exhaust system. Most of you may not know what that is. Generator is designed to run basically at full load. When you're not running it at full load, it'll, carb, it'll build up carbon and it'll wet stack. Um, so then what happens is, is when you go to put load onto that generator, it will choke itself out and stall. The only way to clear the wet stacking or the carbon is to obviously get a load bank on site and obviously a qualified generator tech would bring a load bank on site and increase in increments up the load on the generator to eventually burn the carbon out of the exhaust system to where it would be back to its normal capabilities of handling the normal load that it was designed for. Now back to our little adventure. We actually found something wrong with our generator that day. It wouldn't transfer off, correct? Or it wouldn't cool down. Which one was it? The fire life safety generator, we had a is uh, comms issue with the transfer switch. The transfer switch obviously transferred back to the utility, but it would not signal for the generator to cut off after the 20 minute time delay. So, so it was kind of good that we were there that day and got to see it because we had just replaced a part correct? That was on the, the larger generator that we had done a, a PM on it and then obviously we did we hadn't done a load bank test in a while because I had done one prior but yeah we had replaced some parts on the larger generator that covered the UPS trailer and then obviously the chillers inside and the air conditioner and the majority of the build. It was just like a really cool experience for me getting to see it. I notoriously fuss at Jeremy when he goes on field trips and doesn't invite because I'm eager and I just want to see everything and learn everything. And it was really neat to see how to start everything. It was my first experience with working with the generator in the UPS. Jeremy thoroughly showed me around. This does this, this does that. It was a great experience. And then it was a really cool seeing it not work properly and <laughs> having to troubleshoot and try and figure out. I mean, it wasn't cool. It was kind of stressful and annoying but it wasn't working properly but you know looking back it was a great experience as a learning facility manager on okay this didn't work this triggered this call this person and it was just for, for me it was an amazing experience well one thank you and i love your eagerness to be there and, and to be around me in order for me to show you things because a lot of people they see some things and they're like wow once they say wow they kind of put a mental block up like you can tell them a thousand things but they can't remember it because they're just shocked of what they seen what they experienced and you know obviously being around you you saw it you experienced it and you still had questions and you still remembered what all we went through and i'm sure i could probably send you over to that client today and say <laughs> hey you need to start this generator up because they're going to lose power tonight doing a transfer a, a power swap or something and I feel 100% that I had faith in you, you could do it. I probably could. I know how to get in and what to look for. <laughs> I just need the keys. <laughs> Any other things that someone should know about a UPS or a generator? Proper maintenance. I know a lot of times manufacturers call out specific times or specific PMs that they want to perform. I think mainly the industry standard is probably two PMs a year for UPS system. One is a major where they come in and they test pretty much everything. They also test the batteries and then a minor PM where they come in and just do an overall observation 
of the batteries and the UPS system, making sure everything's okay, everything's clean, uh, and nothing is kind of fixing to rear itself or go bad. So, I, I mean, I highly recommend going by the manufacturer's PMs and what they say or what they specify the intervals between the PM. I was going to say the same thing for generators. I know currently, for the most part, I've seen two PMs for generators as well. And one of those being a major where they come in, change belts, air filters, oil, oil filters. And then sometimes they can do a coolant test. Just depends on, you know, the manufacturer's recommendations. But And then also your service provider. I know a lot of times you may inherit equipment that you're not familiar with. You know, Cummins is different than Kohler. Kohler's different than, I think there's some called Gillette now. It's kind of funny because it sounds like a, a razor. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they're, 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 every one of them is different. But, you know, normally if, if you're not familiar with that manufacturer, always result or consult with your generator technicians or your generator company that you have handling your preventative maintenance. Now you mentioned the coolant testing. That's something that we kind of learned about a couple of years ago. Can you explain that? I understood it, but I can't explain it. So coolant testing is kind of like basically your car. You have a car with, you know, 10 to 15 years on it and you've had it since you've owned it and you've never had a coolant issue. You've never had to change a water pump, never had to change a thermostat. And it's the original antifreeze that's been in the system you know, since you've owned the vehicle. It's, I don't recommend you automatically going and getting it replaced. It would be nice to get it tested. It'll tell you your levels at what level it would freeze at. Forgive me, I'm not a scientist, so I don't know those <laughs> terms on the antifreeze lingo on I don't need that. if it what's the what's the settings or the recommendations at which you replace it due to like how low can it go for freezing. You know, a lot of times I think for the most part it's minus it's minus or at zero to what they say your recommendation is for freeze protection on antifreeze. But testing it on how long a life you have, it'll tell it'll tell you also tell you any type of corroding I don't want to say materials, but bacteria, which shouldn't be, but typically if you have some really old stuff that's not normally ran on a frequent basis, you could get end up getting some bacteria or some type of growth rust in that coolant system. So testing, it's always viable. Also, uh, it, it can also let you know if you have oil in the, in the antifreeze as well. And oil in an antifreeze is a disaster. Uh, it means internal <laughs> gaskets have, may have failed or be leaking, causing oil to be in the antifreeze. And that, is, that does pose a, a threat and possibly catastrophic damage if not, if tested and not fixed pretty soon. But yeah, so there's just, there's a lot to think about when you have generators and you have UPS systems. I would honestly say if you have a provider that you feel comfortable with, ask them about it. They'll be glad to tell you, they'll be glad to explain anything to you, what to do is what not to do's, how to's, how definitely not how to's. Um, but yeah, I mean, and if you don't feel comfortable asking that, I'm sure someone will. And if you don't feel like you're getting an honest enough answer, you know, maybe it might be time to consult with somebody new. Yeah. You know, it's not proprietary information on your generator or your UPS. Yes, the the boards and the engines and the controllers may be proprietary to that manufacturer, but someone at least giving you a little bit of knowledge and how they operate and what, what's on them, meaning the feeds that are power that it supplies when power goes out. You know, maybe you don't know. And that's a lot of questions that a lot of people have these days. I just don't know what's on my UPS system or I don't know what's on my generator. I would strenuously advise for you to figure that out. Yeah, that's critical. You know, there's a lot of codes that have been brought into been into the picture in the last, you know, 10 to 15 years and even even more now up to, you know, up to current code, you know, labeling breakers, uh, labeling panels, where they're fed from, what do they feed? But you know, over a period of time, a lot of things change. Mm -hmm. A lot of people come in and they say, hey, I want power to this row of lights. And they'll quote you, say, you know, electrician or someone will come in and say, well, okay, 500 bucks to move this circuit of lights over to this one. Well, guess what? They might've just removed emergency lights and put them on a regular circuit, or they could have put regular circuit light on your backup generator or your backup UPS system. And one, it's not so much detrimental for a generator for someone to do that, but it could be worse for someone to do it on a UPS because it may not handle the extra load. And how would you go about testing 
to figure that out to make sure that that isn't happening. One is a qualified electrician and a generator tech and possibly a UPS tech on a day where you could perform a shutdown. Or you could pay a lot more money for an electrician, electrician to come in and circuit trace everything. But uh, I would highly advise if you don't know your system, you don't know what it controls, you don't know how it operates, I would highly advise a, a day where you could shut stuff down or now I don't want to say necessarily shut it down, but you could do testing, meaning you go in and you hit that test button on that generator mm -hmm. and transfer the load to the generator and see what all comes on, see what all works. UPS is a little different on testing those or seeing what all's on them. It's kind of hard. It's kind of the same basis. You would just basically have a licensed electrician on site and kill the power feeding that UPS and see what is on that generator after power has been taken away. And then, you know, once you've got everything figured out, cut that breaker back on and everything should come back up to normal. If you're, you know, as I keep saying, if you're unsure, you're unsure, I would definitely have a UPS technician, a certified UPS technician for that specific UPS that you have and a generator tech from that manufacturer or whoever's performing your PMs. And then obviously your normal day to day electrician. You know, it, it's it's difficult. I don't claim to know everything. I just know a lot about all and, and I've been around a lot and I've always been the person to catch on stuff when I see it and very fortunate to have that trait. But your normal day-to-day -day electricians, they will not touch a generator. Mm -hmm. Your UPS guys will not touch a generator nor will your generator guys touch UPS. And electricians, sure. yeah. electricians will say, know. it's got power. That's all I'm doing to yep. it. You need to call a UPS technician. You know, rightfully so. It, there's a lot of liability to it. Yeah. And, you know, electricians, that you, they cover, they carry liability for what they're responsible for. They're not responsible for why did that generator not start or why is that UPS an alarm? Those generator companies, they hold the liability for that generator and the same for the UPS systems. Those companies hold those li large liabilities and they have qualified folks. If they don't have qualified folks, then that's a problem. Uh, but you know, there are a lot of uh, companies out there that do uh, UPS stuff. There's a lot of companies that do generator stuff. Hard to find on a national portfolio basis. Run into that quite a few times on some of the clients that I've represent or work with, but there are, there are companies out there that will work on UPS systems and generators. I do say we could use a lot more of them though. Yes. A lot more tradesmen all the way around yes. for that matter. And back to what you said about asking your companies if you're unsure or don't know something and they'd be willing to teach. I feel like that's for all trades. I mean, that's how I learned a lot of what I have learned. I'm going to name drop like Steve Martin. He would, I could call him up any day and he will answer a question for me. He is the master of all master electricians in my book. <laughs> Just kidding. Hopefully he watches this. Or at least, least listens to it. <laughs> and, you know, I've learned a lot from my vendors as well as mentors like you. And I have had several others. It just depends on what I need to know as to what I'm asking. And so that's just great advice in general. Continue to find, ask questions until you find someone. I struggled with that a little bit. Jeremy watched me struggle and flounder a little bit. Before. He was just like, just ask the question. <laughs> Yeah, I just, you know, I, you and I are a lot alike in that aspect of like someone can explain it to you a thousand times, but seeing is believing. Yes. And once you see it, it's something you, from my viewpoint, it's something that I won't forget. Yeah. It's, I've always been a hands on kind of guy. And, I, you know, reading something, you can forget it. Right. It goes in one ear and out the other, or one eyeball and out the other, however you want to call <laughs> it. That. But, but seeing it and experience it, not, not necessarily having to jump in and have my hands in it, but seeing someone do it, it it's always helped me, has always helped me understand, you know, what to do's, what not to do's, who to call, and what can we do to get them back up and going. Right. You know, it's really funny. My aunt moved out from California, her and her husband, Frank, and they bought a house up in Lexington. And we were all up there last summer. And someone, we were all in the in the basement. She has a finished basement. We were all downstairs, and lo and behold, my son goes upstairs to use the restroom. Well, he flushes the toilet, and next thing you know, water stripping no. on the on the table. No. Yeah, and everybody's just standing around, like, what do I do? So she had ceiling tiles as the ceiling. So I just start popping out ceiling tiles, and got a flashlight, got towels, started trying to clean stuff up, and. Come to find out that toilet where it had tied into another line, the Y had cracked. Oh. And, you know, everybody was like, well, how do you know to do that? I'm like, well, how do you not know to do that? Yeah. I mean, it, it, 
you got to gain access to see where the leak is. You but see you know, some, troubleshoot. True. Um, I, and I, I will say one funny story. I hope my next door neighbor doesn't see this or hear this, but one time he had asked me to help him get rid of some Leland cypress trees next to his house, his front door entrance. And I'm like, yeah, sure. I just hook my old truck up to it and I just slowly pull them out. You know, and I was like, when you see a root, you know, just chop it. You know, the roots will die when you pull those trees out. And the first one went really well, just pulled it right over, pulled it right out, cut it up, burn it. Second one, start pulling it over. He just doing? starts whacking. So he ends up whacking the water line oh, to the well. Oh, so his breaker box was right inside the garage. And I was in the I was in my truck, you know, looking in my rear view mirror and I see a geyser. So I put it in park, I jump out and he's like, like cut the wall, cut the power to the well. So his well is at the end of his driveway at the street. Okay. So he takes off running to the no. street. <laughs> And before he even got to his street, to the end, to his well at the end of the street, I already walked into the garage, seen the breaker for the well, and cut it off. And he's like, how did you know to do that? I get it. There are some folks out there that are book smart and very intelligent, but can't even turn a screwdriver. Yeah. I definitely am not, I am somewhat intelligent, but I can definitely tell you I can turn a screwdriver better than I can do numbers in Excel or uh, Word or PowerPoint document. But I've just always been a hands-on guy. You know, my dad had a steel chainsaw when I was, I think, nine or 10 years old, and he couldn't get the dang thing to crank to save his life. So he just threw it up in the shed and was like, he went and bought another one. So I snuck out in, the garage, in that building one day, and I just took it completely apart, everything in a million pieces, and just cleaned it. All I did was clean it, and I put it all back together. And I said, Daddy, pour some gas in this and see if you can crank it. I couldn't even pull it to crank it. That's how small I was. I mean, I wasn't that strong, but I mean, it was a really big chainsaw. So it wasn't like, yeah. you know, I was a weakling. I've never been a weakling, but, you know, obviously not my size. But my dad put gas in it and uh, he cranked it up, cranked the first time. And wow. he was like, holy cow, how did you do that? I said, I just took it apart and cleaned everything and put it back together. And I'm not saying you take all your generators and your gases <laughs> apart and put them back together, but... You know, it just goes to show that some folks are capable or not capable. I, that's the wrong term. Let me rephrase that. There are a lot of folks out there that are, not, that are not mechanically inclined, and there are a lot of folks out there that are mechanically inclined. And definitely the ones that are mechanically inclined, you see them few and, few and far between these days. Mm -hmm. uh, not going to get into why, as <laughs> they're the whys as to why there's not that many tradesmen out there. Uh, we don't have that much time, and nor will this podcast get very far. Uh, but you know, you can tell that you can tell when you have a qualified person on site, yeah, and if they know what they're doing. And as a facility manager, you're not the wrench turner anymore. A lot of facility managers, I, uh, uh, I know you're not the wrench turner anymore. That's what your engineers are for. But you still need to know how to. That's the hard part: is learning how to manage at the situation, the workflow, all of that, and dealing with the stakeholders, that's really more your role as a facility manager. Whereas you're, you were very strong in the engineering because that's your background, and I'm more in, strong on some of the other because that's my background. That's why you and I feel like mesh so well. You taught me a ton. I tried teaching you some things. I don't know if it stuck. They stuck. <laughs> but. You know, yes, you have to know the hands-on, but as a facility manager, you have to you have to actually kind of be hands-off ninety. I would say ninety percent of the time. Yeah, I do miss being out in the field. I do, but I have a lot of stuff to do at home, so I turn <laughs> wrenches and screwdrivers at home. You're always but, doing something. <laughs> yeah, uh, my honeydew list is long but distinguished. So. <laughs> But yeah, I do, I do miss being out in the field and, and to get what you're saying. When you step away from that, it's always nice to know or the, you know, your technicians. And, I, and, I'm not, and I don't ever claim to be a know-it-all. And I always say that. When, it, when a technician comes to me and says, well, I think this is wrong, whatever the case may be, whether it's HVAC, whether it's generators, UPSs, plumbing, I'll, I'll say something to them and I'll say, you know, my first remark is I'm not trying to argue. I'm just trying to rule out everything or what are, what are the possibilities could it be? And, and you know, they, they respect that. And it, I don't want to say that I put myself to where 
I ha- I use what I know to catch people doing wrong things or people quoting stuff that I just don't really need. I do it as in as in they have respect for me and I have the utmost respect for them because I can learn just so I can learn just as much over the phone now. Whereas before, like I said, I, I needed to see it as growing up. I, I'm not saying since I've seen it, I don't want to see it anymore. And I know it all. And that's not the case. But it is very beneficial. You know, like I did I did some visits the other day at some of my clients' locations. And, you know, the lady was like, why are you taking so many pictures? <laughs> and I was like, well, ma'am, whenever you call me or, you know, you put in a work order that, you know, your sprinkler system's leaking or, you know, your, your generator's running. You don't know where it's at. You don't know where the transfer switch. You don't know. You don't know anything. I said, then I just go in your file folder for that for that location, and I'll look through the pictures, and I'll say, it's there, and this is the green box. That's your transfer switch. Outside by the utility transformer is your generator. So it, it always it always helps seeing some things when you've never seen them before, because there's locations that I, I serve for or take care of for our, for my for my client now, not yours, but you know I've never been to. Yeah. And and they'll call you up and they'll be like, hey, what do I do? And I'm like, first thing I tell them obviously is create a work order. Yeah. Um, no, I don't. I never advise uh, my client to go into harm's way or put themselves into a, a dangerous situation. Like, for instance, resetting breakers, cutting off generators, or manually transferring the load if the if the generator doesn't transfer back to utility. No, uh, mainly it's just guidance on where where things are at. Right. You know, for one thing that we didn't really speak much of, you have a, a remote enunciator panel. And that is a remote alarm panel for your generators. Multiple alarms on the front, uh, I could say low fuel, low coolant, over crank, a, a lot of different things depending on the manufacturer. And they're like, what's that for? That's if you have an alarm for your generator. Uh, I know nowadays there's, you know, generators are being sold with remote notification. If, you're li- if your client can support that, then by all means, you know, persuade them or talk them into doing that because it's very beneficial, if, especially if you have like an energy management system, if you could tie that in your generator into that or even your UPS system. I know with our client, we don't tie into the specifics of the, the UPS or the generator, but we know when the generator is up and running. Mm-hmm. We also know when that UPS creates an alarm. So, and, that, and that's the basics. And some folks don't even have that, They're, you know, but they normally have someone on site that is, I would say, somewhat familiar to know if they have a problem. Yeah, I mean, you can tell if you're, you've got an alarm going off that you've never heard before. You can go trace and figure out where it's coming from, at least enough to put in a work order. Yep. Well, I mean, it's also good, too, for folks that are, if they even if you don't have a maintenance guy, but you're that go-to person on the, at site or even remotely to know where your stuff is. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, some of the locations that I visited last week, the oddest thing is, is generators on the roof. You know, so if let's just say your provider doesn't, your your generator provider doesn't relay that to the technician, and it's an emergency type situation, and the guy gets there and he circles the building 500 times, and he's like, he calls up dispatch and says, "There's no, there's no dang generator here." Yeah. And dispatch goes, uh, "Yeah, there is." Well, he's going. His first remark is going to be, "Where's it at?" Yeah. You know, it's in a locked okay. pit house. Yeah a locked penthouse on the roof. And there's quite a few locations where we have the generators on the roof. You don't normally see a diesel fuel generator on the roof uh, unless you have remote fuel filling access. Uh, Most of those are natural gas, but. And I don't want want to get into specifics on diesel versus natural gas. Yeah, your your natural gas fire generator might last, you know, several years longer because it's cleaner and diesel generators can handle more load due to the combustion and all that stuff. You know, rely on your engineers that's designing your building or uh, your generator service provider if you're going to replace them and what they would spec or potentially go back with because, you know, every instance is different. You know, some people say retail is critical. I do see that retail is critical for, you know, keeping the doors open. Mm -hmm. So if they don't have lights, they don't have air, then customers are complaining and leaving. But technically, your, your more sophisticated, more critical services is data centers, your cell phone providers, uh, that sort of thing. Because hospitals. The hospitals, the most definitely. If they go down and they don't have backup, there's problems. There's so, and As you said, hospitals, that's life-threatening. But, mm-hmm. you know, they, they do have their own protocols and what they do. And, 
And I would hope to think that if my life was on the line, somebody there at the hospital would know if they lost power and that UPS or that generator didn't kick on and my chest is open with them working on my heart. Right. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, I'm, I feel certain that they have everything in place. I'm and sure then, the facility manager must have the most stressful job at a hospital. Yeah, I, I would say so. I, I mean, I had a stressful job as, as working in the cell phone industry. You know, we installed multi-thousand app services, installing megawatt generators, paralleling them together with transfer switches, putting in manual transfer switches with tap boxes outside. You know, their engineers designed for 80% of the load only. They wouldn't max their generators out. They wouldn't max their UPSs out. So what happened with AT&T going down a couple weeks ago? Uh, everybody has their own theory on that. Uh, I can't speculate, nor do I want to be held accountable for what I say. But you know, I, Do you think a UPS or a generator could have prevented that, or do you think it was something outside of that? I think it was something outside of that, because it was very strange that it happened uh, in several states. Mm-hmm. Funny to mention that, I was traveling to one of my client's locations, and I'm on, I'm on AT&T, and I never had a problem. But the gentlemen, that, or the technicians that I was going to meet, they were on AT&T, and their phones didn't work. Mm-hmm. So it was just really interesting. I, I, I can't, I don't... I can't begin to speculate. I'm not that intelligent when it comes to the cell phone industry and their servers, but when it comes to their power and backup power, I'm very familiar with that. But uh, I, I, don't, I don't know. I, I doubt very seriously it had anything to do with a generator or a UPS system. It was interesting. It was a moment where I was like, you know what? I'm really glad that I didn't get to switch to at t from Verizon. <laughs> I was supposed to, and uh, thanks to I, me, it didn't work. I broke my phone, and Jeremy had to order me a phone as an emergency. And uh, he was like, "Well, you're stuck with Verizon. Sorry." So yeah. yeah, that moment, I was like, "I'm I'm thankful for that day that I dropped my phone at five o'clock on a Friday night." It was more just like, do you think that UPS or generators could have prevented that or had any effect to it? Not necessarily, what do we really think happened? <laughs> okay, so on it, so, you know, I, I do remember Katrina. And if, for those that don't remember Katrina, it was very catastrophic. Yeah. Um, at that time, I was working for the one of the world's largest uh, cell phone providers. Not in that market, but obviously in North and South Carolina. And, you know, where they were dispatching fuel trucks to go down to fuel generators because they had, you know, remote 10,000 gallon tanks, 20,000 gallon tanks underground. And, you know, they were running dry because they never knew when they were going to get power because, wow. you know, it was, a, it was a huge storm. And, yeah. and I, I recall that, you know, tankers were going down and they were being robbed wow. or or the government would step in and, and say it. and take it because it had to go to the hospitals or, you know, other type of life-threatening wow. situations. So yeah, but you know, a lot of places, um, you know, since Katrina, a lot of the cell phone providers they have a lot of industry standard type stuff that they work on, and they have they have in-house engineers or you know architects or whatever that design their facilities to where it will withstand a Cat Four hurricane or you know whatever the instance may be. And then a lot of them they're like, let's just have. For instance, cell sites close to the coast and not have our main switch center that close. Yeah. You know, I don't I don't want to say that all of them tore all their switch centers down and, and rebuilt them somewhere else, but they did improvise to where if this switch goes down, which switch could back it up or vice versa. So yeah, it, it, it was it was a huge storm and, and it was it's definitely one that'll never be forgotten from a perspective of how cat- catastrophic it was, how many lives were lost and then yeah. what people learned on when that happened. You know, a lot of times things are designed for, you know, down for five days, yes. no power. So they have their, their, their fuel system is designed to run or they're, 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 they're going to have five days worth of fuel mm-hmm. on site in that tank underground or that belly tank underneath that general or, you know, obviously natural gas. But they weren't expecting, you know, weeks to months and, and what to do if that happens because it never it, Yes, I'm sure it has happened, but the technology that we have and we live off of and we basically demand from our internet or cell phone providers, yeah, they never experience anything like that. Yeah. And it, it definitely opened up the door the door on engineering and design and where to put stuff, what's gonna back it up when something goes down. It changed all of risk management. It, it did, it really did. Which I'm going to be speaking with Rizzo about, our uh, buddy over there. God Um, forbid. (laughs) 
Before we wrap up, I do like to wrap up with bloopers or funny work orders. Do you have any to share today? I'm sure you have a ton, but... I always get caught up on this one because I, I was asked this before and I was like, I can't remember anything. I know, I do too. I, there's only one that keeps coming back to me. Like, I mean, of course we all get the, my shut off valve won't shut off. And it's like, <laughs> you know, you shut off valve? Yeah. Or like, so my, my really good one, I was going to save this one, but you were around for this. We get a work order for a dock door not shutting one night and it was an emergency work order. It gets called in. I answer the phone, blah, blah, blah. I'm not looking at the computer. I'm handling it via phone. Well, some, I'm assuming it was my call center, our call center I mistyped, but it did not type dock door. It said my dick door does not shut and I did not catch it for six months and I created multiple copies of this work order and sent it to several service providers and no one called me out on it until I went to email the client through the work order and was reading over it and went, oh my gosh, I cannot believe this. So yes, we've had that, the shit off valves, anything else? Well, it's funny because, you know, I, I know everyone that's listened to this or will listen to it has seen my Christmas vacation. <laughs> <laughs> and I wished we could just get away with the shitters full, send <laughs> yes. help. Um, <laughs> But, you know, technically you can't say that, so uh, I guess we would say the crapper is full. Please send help. Please send help. Now. Okay, one more, and this is in honor of Jeff, um, our coworker that passed away. He, We had a location flooding, our location that you and I went to, and remember all the videos and photos that were going around, and he responded back, it looks like the Titanic, guys. Y'all should probably get out. They were walking through the water with the electrical outlets and everything, and I just remember him saying that and you know he was a man of few words so when he made a joke like it was hella funny it was um we met some greatly yeah you got me hard i'm sorry uh for those of you who don't know i still haven't taken him out of my favorites list on my phone i love that jeremy uh he, he was a man of few words but when he had something to say it was uh very funny and very catchy yes um well, let's go ahead and wrap it up. Uh, thank you again. And I'm going to have you come back probably for two or three more topics just because you're such a wealth of knowledge and I appreciate all of your insight, your stories, your friendship, your mentorship, all of the above. But thank you so much for coming today. And just as a quick plug for this podcast, if you, anybody listening will rate and review this podcast, it does help us with more visibility on charts or whatever it's whatever it is. So if you'll rate and review it, if you liked it, if you don't, please don't tell me. <laughs> Just kidding. It might have something to do with me. <laughs> if you don't like Big Red, get over it. So one question Yeah. Uh, that I have that I think a lot of people will have. Oh shoot. What if they want to hear more about specifics on generators and UPSs? Who do they reach out to? So I do have an email, hello at facility files. That is a good question. You can email them. If you just want to hear more in depth on generators, more in depth on UPS systems, you know, what more can you learn on them just as being an on-site person or a person that's not a technician, because I'm not a technician, but uh, as a facility manager, definitely here to answer questions and show any type of guidance that I can. But I was curious what happens if... Yeah, or hello if at facilityfiles.com is the email, and I can... Get them in if you want to speak directly to Jeremy, I can get them in contact with you. Or if just a general question, I'll get you linked up with someone. Are you even active on LinkedIn, sir? You have a LinkedIn. I have a LinkedIn. <gasps> what? Um, I still get emails. I, I can't tell you the last time I logged into it. We need to get you back active. Yeah. I, Are you under Jeremy or Jeremy? Jeremy Haynes. And then I'm Elizabeth Ignatowitz on LinkedIn. We can, I'll make sure to get you in contact with Jeremy if you need him. He's a good one to have in your back pocket. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thanks for having me today. Yeah, absolutely. Look forward to coming back. Anytime. All right. Bye, y'all. Thanks, everyone.